Welcome to our ongoing series of videos from Chapter 1, Section 6, focusing on types of structural action. We're now looking at bending. We've been talking about axial tension and axial compression. Now we're going to talk about bending. Uh, there are a few general comments we can make on elements and bending. Uh, and, and some of this won't be totally clear to you immediately, but they will be clarified as we go along. We must account for providing adequate shear strength, moment strength, and stiffness. And over the course of this uh, series of courses, or this course sequence, we will make a distinction often between strength and stiffness. Stiffness may mean that the structure moves too much and people find that disconcerting or distracting, or it may mean that parts move enough that uh, brittle portions of the structure crack. Um, but that's to be distinguished from strength, which has to do with whether the thing will collapse or not. Um, another comment we'll make about elements in bending is that depth is crucial to providing both moment strength and stiffness. And finally, we also have to account for lateral stability. So we're going to start. This is um, the first of two lectures on bending. We're going to talk about uh, shaping the cross-section. So, just to reiterate, we've talked about tension elements, we've talked about compression elements that start off straight and deflect abruptly or um, move abruptly laterally, and you're reminded that this mode of failure is not self-limiting. What's keeping this thing in this shape is this uh, two by four this bit blocking piece that's been put in there to stop the action before the structure totally collapses. Uh, this is sudden, it's abrupt, it is not self-limiting, and rarely gives any kind of warning. Bending, on the other hand, we have a horizontal element which gets a load on it, and as a subsequence it deflects downward, and it's not abrupt. We add a little bit of load, we get some deflection. We add some more load, we get more deflection. Um, if we got this much deflection in a floor, we would find that extremely disturbing. So this sort of illustrates that point that we have certain expectations about the stiffness of a structure. Most of us have been out on a diving board. We don't have any fear that the board is going to break, even though it moves a lot. But in our buildings, we don't tolerate that kind of movement. People have an expectation of a certain level of stiffness. And it's pretty crucial that you design that in because if your clients are disappointed with the way the building feels, they will let you know. And many people equate a lack of stiffness with a lack of quality or a lack of safety, even though that may not be uh, the case. All right, so this also is a reiteration of some of the points we made up above. If we have a deep beam like this, it is likely to fail in shear. In the case of wood, there are weak planes along the grain, and basically these two parts are trying to shear past each other, and if we exceed the shear capacity of the wood, we'll see a failure of this sort. For sort of intermediate proportions, we're likely to see a tearing of the material on the bottom or some kind of compression failure on the top. And then if we have really shallow beams, they're likely to be def uh, limited by uh, deflection. So our stiffness criterion is that we have to keep this deflection within some reasonable bounds. Uh, the reason under load that this failure, uh, this moment failure, almost always occurs at the center is because the influence that's causing that failure maximizes or peaks out at the center of the beam. So eventually we're going to worry about quantitatively designing for all of these things but we want you to be aware right at the moment that these are things we have to design for. All right, so we talked before if we have a beam, uh, when it's sitting dormant on the tabletop, it uh, is flat, like so. And then when we raise it up on a couple of bricks and we allow it to uh, sp uh, span but under its own weight, so we have support forces here. And here, and we have a distributed force all along it, which is the self-weight of the beam. 
When that happens, we get um, we go from a situation where these two vertical lines, they're both vertical and they're parallel and then after that they're st still straight lines but they're no longer parallel. Um, there's been a shortening that has occurred along the top, a stretching that has occurred along the bottom and this red line along the center line is called a neutral axis where there is no shortening or elongation. This is not a neutral axis in every sense of the word though because we already talked about the tendency of shearing to occur along this plane in wood. So there's a high level of shear stress there, but none of the bending stress that's causing this particular kind of deformation. So we draw that bending stress something like this. We have a lot of compression on the top. We have tension on the bottom. And as we said, at the neutral axis, we have zero stress um, on this interface. All right, now, those are just to sort of show you what the stresses are that are associated with this phenomenon of a bending member spanning from one point to another. And we're going to get into those things in a much more quantitative way after a while. But right now, what we're going to focus on are a few simple things that you know uh, from experience. And that experience now is sufficient that it will begin to fuel your intuition. So for example, here we start with a three inch wide by one sixteenth inch sheet of uh, styrene plastic. And when we try to make it span between these two support points, it won't actually even support its own weight. So this person is standing with his hand underneath this to sort of give you the general sense of what's happening, but it's in the process of uh, deforming so much that it's gonna collapse through. So it's really not even spanning under its own self weight. If we turn it up on edge, it gets stronger. It not only can support its self-weight, but it can begin to uh, support a small amount of load also. And we all intuitively know this. If somebody gave us a board and asked us to break it, we'd put it between two support points and we'd lay it flat and we'd jump up and down. Uh, we intuitively know that's its weak direction. We would not turn it up on edge and try and jump on it up and down on it that way because we know inherently that that's stronger. So here's an example of just such a beam. This is uh, what we call a solid sawn board. Uh, they come in nominal 2x4, 2x6, 2x8, 2x10, and 2x12. And by the way, a 2x10 is not fully 2 inches anymore because it shrank during curing and then it gets planed down or surfaced on four sides. So a two by 10 is actually one and a half by nine and a quarter. And that's what these guys are using for these floor joists here. And they're nailing plywood decking down to the bottom of it. So we can't span very far with the decking because the decking does not have a very favorable orientation. The decking actually is more like that. And so the supports have to be fairly closely spaced in order for that to act as a beam. So we try to go a modest distance, like two feet or 16 inches, spanning in this direction, depending upon the structure we're building and what the decking is. Uh, but this span will be fairly small in the other direction where we might be spanning 10 or 12 or 14 or even 16 feet. We're going to use these solid sawn boards turned up on edge like this. So we will call those joists. Um, as the, the beam elements that are directly supporting the decking. Now if we look at this element, it doesn't have much load on it, and if we add a little more load, it begins to do the following. It buckles to the side. And the reason is that we have compression. Let me go back here. We have compression in the top part of the structure up here, and that material being in compression is going to try to buckle out from the load, and that's exactly what's happening here. It's saying, hey, there's nothing to keep us from getting out from under this load by moving to one side or the other. So this structure was in the process of collapsing laterally. And again, its, its behavior has been frozen by the fact that this person is supporting this weight to, continue, to keep that failure from progressing. Uh, so eventually, we're going to actually show this in video form where things collapse. But for right now, you know that this thing started off straight and that it's collapsing to the side now. 
All right, so we can help stop that. In, in the case of a beam, what we're going to do is nail down this decking to the top of the beam. And so the beam will support the decking under gravity loads. And then the decking kind of returns the favor by laterally bracing the top part of these joists, uh, which is the portion that's in compression and it wants to buckle laterally. Now we can do that with decking or we can do it with, um, let me just see something here for a second. I do want to make one other comment, by the way. Um, even after we've stabilized this top cord or the top portion of this beam, there's a tendency for the beam to flip to the side. In other words, for the bottom part to move out from under the top part. So in a lot of buildings, you'll see either solid blocking or some kind of cross bracing uh, in between these beams, which is supposed to force the bottom part of the beam to stay under the top part. So we haven't totally solved the lateral bracing problem by putting the decking on it, but we've taken care of the major part of it. All right, so we can also achieve this bracing effect by uh, adding material perpendicular to that vertical sheet of material. And this is, produces what we call a, an I-beam, or in the steel lexicon now it's called a wide flange beam. And you'll notice now, uh, even though this beam is shallower than that one, uh, it's outperforming that one because it's keeping the material under the load and not allowing it to buckle laterally. So this I section or wide flange section is very effective and now we have a very substantial load on this beam compared to anything we've supported earlier. So that wide flange is basically this cross section right here, uh, which is the standard way we make steel beams. One of the way, reasons this works so well, by the way, is that we don't have significant shearing issues in steel beams because steel is so strong in shear, whereas compared to uh, concrete and wood, both of those materials tend to be quite weak in shear. And so we would never, for example, start with a solid sawn wood board and cut material away to make it lighter because uh, if we did, the webbing material would become too weak. We can see that kind of shape at the scale of uh, a beam in a building, uh, supporting a floor, for example, but we also see it occasionally in a situation like this where we have this huge uh, flanged beam or I section beam. And you'll notice it's been worked out perfectly. The wind loads on this wall are not too great. Um, because there's not much surface area for the wind to impact. So this I section has been turned uh, with its weak direction uh, supporting the force on this wall. Now the force on this wall is just huge. Um, and as a consequence, this I section has been turned in the strong direction to resist the force on that face. Um, so there's an eye section that you need a drawing of the building to even be aware that it's there. Now, I mentioned you wouldn't take a solid sawn beam and cut away material because you'd have a shear problem, but if you have a material like oriented strand board or plywood, both of which work really well in shear, if you have that kind of material, you can actually make a web out of it like this. These are called a wood eye joist. And the webbing can either be oriented strand board, which is this kind of wafer board. It can be plywood and the top flanges can either be solid sawn wood that's been finger jointed together to give you long members, or it can be this material, which is basically like laminated layers of wood, all of which are oriented along the length of the beam. Okay. Now the wide flange, or the flanged type beam is there to address moment failure. In other words, it's addressing this problem right here. But we also want to be aware of this kind of problem. It uh, is a failure mode that can occur in wood, but it can also occur because we don't think of it properly when we put things together that we intend to have composite structural action. So a classic example might be the following. 
Uh, here we have a piece of acrylic plastic, which is spanning from this point to that point, and it's supporting 100 grams of weight, and you'll see it has a certain curvature to it. We can stack up 10 of those things in a stack, and if we don't glue them together, and we allow them to slide relative to each other, we don't get any kind of composite action out of them. And interestingly enough, if we have 10 of them stacked and we put 10 times as much weight here as we had up there, we see the same general deflected shape down here. In other words, if they're not glued together, 10 of them on top of each other is just 10 times as strong as one of them. But we can do a lot better than that if we glue them together and get composite action. So here on the top we see that situation where they're not glued together and we've got this much weight on it and we're seeing a very substantial amount of deflection. And now here's a, a bunch of those pieces of acrylic glued together properly and now you'll notice that even with a substantially larger weight, so we've taken the weight that was on there up above and then we've added all of this weight and in spite of that we see no evidence of deflection in this beam. We might see a little bit if we sight along the length of it, but basically we have very substantial visible deflection up here. We have none down here. So we have drastically enhanced the system by gluing those together. And we do this with wooden beams. We take two by tens, for example, turn them on the side and glue them in a stack into a beam called a glue lamb beam and we're able to get a tremendous high quality performance from that. We're able to get extremely large beams of almost any size we want. Um, and the key though is we have to make sure that we've glued those together in a, in a way where we can be assured that they will stay glued together in order to achieve the kind of composite action that we're trying to get to. Uh, here's just another illustration of that. We've got some boards that are put together in a, in a frame that's really weak. Uh, the joints are poor, the, the wood can bend pretty easily. Uh, this is a little model that we're looking at and here we have a weight on it and this weight is causing this large deflection. If we take the weight off and let it straighten up and then we glue some sheets of, of uh, crescent board here on the side, now all of a sudden uh, you'll see you have huge deflection with that little weight and now we can drastically increase the weight and we're getting almost no deflection. So we have a kind of composite action here that's giving us much better structural performance, but we have to have absolute confidence that the glue we used or the connections that we used uh, between this sheet material and the wood is reliable. And by the way, we do things, we call them folded plate wood structures. And this is a little scale model of what that might be. In this case, uh, it's been designed to let in daylight through these roof apertures. But basically, this is a folded plate. And there's another folded plate and they brace each other and are able to span this distance. Okay, so here we have an I-beam and you'll notice there are a bunch of uh, what we call shear studs or the name has been changed to uh, I'll have to think what the name is. Some kind of headed shear connector. Um, at any rate, these are welded down to the beam. Uh, concrete is going to get poured in a decking on top of this. These uh, shear uh, elements come up and make sure that the concrete doesn't slide relative to the beam. So the new effective depth of the beam is from the top of the concrete down to the bottom of the beam as opposed to being from the top of the beam down to the bottom of the beam. This shows them pre-welded. Uh, we don't do that anymore. We weld them in the field through the decking, but this is what you're looking at. These are the shear connectors which are welded to a beam which is down below the corrugated decking. Okay, so we're talking about cross sections and we've, we've basically said the wide flange or I section is a very desirable section. Um, we don't necessarily need all that material everywhere. There, there are times when we can cut away parts of the section. Uh, so in this case, 
The flanges have been cut back. They originally went out to the end of this beam, but they've been cut back in order to facilitate a connection at the end. So we're going to slide this element into a slot uh, that looks something like this, and then we're going to load it, and we're going to discover that this entire connection system performs really well. In other words, at the end, we didn't need that flange material, but we absolutely do need this web material here, and we need for it to go all the way in here to make that structural engagement. On the other hand, if we cut all that flange material away at the center of the beam, we not only are reducing the amount of material that's functioning in tension and compression to create the bending moment that's necessary there, but we've also annihilated our lateral bracing system. So suddenly a beam that was working really well is just barely marginal. So here we've loaded it a little bit and it's starting to keel over to the side. And basically this process is not self-limiting. So we caught this photographically before the full collapse was over. So what that says is you can remove flange material at the supports um, assuming that it's a simple span beam, but you don't want to remove flange material at the center. Um, we have a similar issue having to do with web material. We do not want to remove web material near the end of the beam. That's where the shear is high and the web material is handling the shear, but we can remove that material near the center of the beam. So that concludes our simple discussion of shaping the cross section of a bending member to provide adequate uh, moment capacity and stiffness.